regular council meeting at 101. We'll move on to item number six of our agenda, Committee of the Whole. So uh, what I am going to need is a motion that Lamont County Council resolve the March 14th meeting and uh, to Committee of the Whole. Councilor Anaka. I move that Lamont County Council resolve the March 14th, 2023 regular council meeting to Committee of the Whole at 1.01 p.m. Questions or concerns? All those in favor? Aye. It's carried 5-0. <clears throat> okay, we will now go to item 6.1, the Livestock Emergency Response Trailer Storage Update. Mr. Reeve, this item emerged out of a concern of how and where this uh, piece of equipment was stored. The uh, item became a broader concern in terms of our ability to staff with qualified people and to deploy when necessary. This led to some discussion and conversation about engaging municipal partners. Go ahead, Chief. Thank you, Your Worship and Council. As Mr. Tarnowski just uh, mentioned, there was two uh, potential issues identified with the li Livestock Emergency Response Trailer. First was uh, the storage conditions and the second was staffing. November 2022, Council instructed administration to investigate some partnerships uh, that could see the tra trailer utilized to its fullest capacity. Um, we immediately began investigating some options um, with our closest mutual aid partners and we received a nearly immediate response from Strathcona County uh, Agricultural Services. Um, they advised that they were incredibly interested in the partnership that would see the trailer stored at uh, Strathcona County Fire Station 4, which is in Josephburg, and uh, remain accessible to both parties. Um, unfortunately, due to uh, the combination of the holiday season and then a retirement of that individual we were talking with, um, the kind of the progress forward momentum had stalled just a little bit. Um, administration was able to uh, was recently able to establish contact with a new contact at Strathcona County, and uh, they indicated that there was some background legwork that was continuing on their end despite the retirement of the previous individual. And uh, essentially, all stakeholders appear to be supportive of this initiative and to, to see a joint use partnership. And so the partnership would see essentially Strathcona County become the primary user and responsible party for storage of the trailer, and Lamont County would continue to be uh, to have access to the trailer uh, as required and access additional staff support if it's deployed in the Lamont County area. Um, we would not be looking for any exchange of money in this partnership. Uh, we would be essentially when items on the trailer are required to be replaced, we would be looking for uh, some sort of cost sharing recommendation that would be mutually beneficial to both parties. Um, generally speaking, Speaking, uh, it is believed that the majority of this information or this equipment could be replaced on a grant basis versus a, a physical taxpayer funded initiative. Um, we are not seeking formal approval today or a formal decision. Uh, that's why we're in committee of the whole. We're just looking to see if there's any additional council feedback that could help guide our uh, discussions with Strathcona County forward. Um, there has been no final support decision to date from Strathcona County either. So this is just being a little bit ahead of the ball, you know, in anticipation of that decision coming forward. Um, so with that, I would turn it back uh, to council for thoughts on kind of the arrangement recommendations and any concerns you may have. So the, the Lamont Ag Society uh, donated a trailer and then together they all built it and it is for <clears throat> looking after the Lamont County and surrounding counties. So Correct. I think it's Stratcona stores it there. I'm pretty sure the guys that put the biggest money into it, I'll be very happy, especially if they have some people trained for it too yep. in Stratcona. And it's uh, just as quick to get from the, 10 minutes, 10 minutes, five minutes difference between Buderheim and there, so. Yeah, certainly would agree that in terms of location, that's a, a prime location. Yeah, I, I would say that it's, like you said, prime location is it's right off Highway 15, and it's very accessible to, for the county too, if we needed it. Well, even south to 16 and then east of Mundare, they're there, right? Yeah. yeah. So who maintains ownership of this? So at this time, we would retain the physical ownership of it. We wouldn't be transferring ownership of it. It would just be a partnership in terms of storing and using the trailer. And we provide the insurance on it and everything Correct. else. Okay. 
that still remains the property of Lamont County. And I should just uh, add that that's the intent. Of course, when Strathcona comes back, if there's a different arrangement that they would like to see, then of course we would come to council for approval of such a, essentially a transfer of ownership at that time. Any other comments or questions? I think it's a could be a great arrangement. I think sure. your your concerns. You feel the Ag Society would have an issue with nope. this? No, no. Nope. I'm pretty sure if uh, Strathcona gave us a dollar for it, they would sell it to them, and because they're uh, it is the surrounding counties, anyways, two hills. It was going to be right in the middle, so it uh, it'll be intended for the use they bought it for. So. Yeah. The only issue I have with this, and maybe Strathcona is a good uh, community to join forces with, is if we do have a cattle line or roll over or something and stuff, you're going to need some specialized skills there to deal with that situation. Yeah. And untrained volunteer firefighters <laughs> probably are not the right people to be trying to round up. So with there being the most horses in Strathcona County, I think in all of Alberta or all of Canada and stuff, I think there's going to be adequate number of people that if it's advertised properly, you could probably get a pretty good core group of people to coordinate a roundup if that's what was needed and stuff. So I think it's a great idea. Great partnership. Great. Then that, uh, that's the direction we'll continue to move forward to and hopefully we can come up with a final uh, agreement to bring before council in short order here. Okay. Anything else? <coughs> Motion? No. Uh, yeah, I need a motion to accept his information. Aaron? Make a motion that the committee of the whole accept the livestock emergency response trailer storage update report as information. Questions or concerns? Debate on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor? <laughs> Councillor Whitus? I yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next item, Committee of the Whole, 6.2, Chief Administrative Officer Bylaw number 824.20. Oh, sorry, my... Nine agenda said 6.2 is the benefit plan. You're 6.3, Rodney. Um, I have 6.2 as the, the Are we out of order? That's impossible. Oh, well, sorry. We'll go with the Reeves. Yeah. You were following the Reeves agenda. <clears throat> okay. Go ahead, Debbie. Good afternoon, Reeve councillors. So at the last council meeting of February 28th, administration was directed to bring forward the Chief Administrative Officer bylaw for review. So with this our briefing note, you will see attached the CAO bylaw, as well as the minutes that um, adopted or passed the, the CAO bylaw on page 314 is what I have on mine. I don't know if that's the correct numbering. 249. 249, okay. As well as legal advice that was provided by Brownlee regarding oh, bylaw sorry. 8. Yeah, that's on 249. 8-2420. So I guess um, we're looking for direction as to what portions of this bylaw you would like us to review and how you would like us to make those amendments. I think the concern that was brought forward regarding this bylaw was uh, 4.3 Clause B, uh, which uh, reads as follows, in order to carry out the responsibility of the position, the CAO has the authority to implement any internal reorganization of responsibilities and duties required for the effective and efficient operation of the municipality. If a major organizational change is affected, the CAO shall report such a change to council. 
And I think where council's concern with this particular policy and the wording is that council wanted to have a certain level of control over the organization chart. We were, <clears throat> we were actually told the organizational chart was councils and uh, we had a change on it. So I asked where and they said under the number 4B under that loophole, the wording of it. So I want to change the wording of it because uh, we uh, come up with an organizational chart and we expect administration to stick with it. So do you have any particular wording, Councillor Whitus, or? No, we had a word. Because when I looked at this thing, the uh, a word that I came up with yesterday is if if a major organizational change is contemplated, the CAO shall report such a change to council prior to enactment. And that didn't happen. No, no, I just discussed this okay. yesterday. So if we want to change the wording, that is wording we could change it to. So if there's contemplation of changing the org chart. Council would have to be advised prior to that change happening. So, Mr. Reeve, could I ask uh, Deputy Reeve Voitis a question? You said we were told that council owns the org chart. Who told you that? In a meeting, when we were doing the organizational chart, when we were doing this thing, we were told by administration that it's uh, it's ours and ours to change or ours to keep. So and then it, uh, it changed and we got payroll being done in a different way. So, the, so I asked how did that happen and this was thrown nothing, at me. Nothing changed between the approval of this bylaw and uh, any organizational structure change that came in the, in the late fall. Uh, in fact, if you look on page 49 of the uh, legal opinion, that is what led to council's approval of the CAO bylaw the way it is. The administrative head of the municipality, which is the CAO, should be interpreted broadly to include authority over all matters of human resources issues involving <coughs> staff. As such, we would advise council not to attempt to exercise authority over restructuring staff and administration as this power properly is reserved for the CAO. So that was the basis upon which this bylaw was approved. Uh, another approach, and the Reeve has, has suggested one, another one that uh, council could consider is to add a reference to the CAO having to work within the approved budget and staffing complement because that's what council approves in the budget. If you truly want uh, the CAO to be able to achieve efficiencies, arrange staff in the best uh, way possible to meet the requirements that council identifies, then provide the CAO some latitude. The organizational chart is set up by the councillors and it's expected to be followed the way it is in there. This guy, this uh, lawyer, if he wants to uh, run an election in a municipality and and uh, and luckily uh, get non or voted in, and he wants to write one like that, give her. But uh, that's our way of controlling. That's the uh, councillors don't have very much to per, to uh, look after the ratepayers and their decisions. That's one thing you can limit the staff. And yeah, the budget with the pricing, but uh, that gives us our control of something in the county. I think if you read the legal opinion also, if you go to page 251, like the beginning part of the legal opinion deals with hiring, firing, and I think council all admits that that's outside of our domain. We're, we're within the governance domain, but if you get to the uh, last, second last paragraph, the first sentence in it, in the constant of context of HR matters, council does have a role in ensuring that appropriate policies are in place and that the CAO is acting within that policy framework when making decisions regarding the hiring, firing, promotion, and discipline of staff and administration. Now, this is a legal opinion of, of one lawyer from one law firm. I know council had a meeting with another lawyer from another firm. Uh, Councillor Wick wasn't present for that meeting. 
but at that particular meeting, we were advised that by that lawyer, who's uh, a pretty seasoned lawyer, that council can act any control over the CAO that they feel warranted through bylaw and policy. So, if we want to put in this that we control the org chart or we have to see changes to the org chart ahead of time, I think it's within council's prerogative to make it part of the CAO bylaw that that's a responsibility that he has to do. I would, I would be in favor of the changes that you had suggested uh, under 4.3 A or B. Uh, Replacing the word affected with contemplated. Yeah, 4B. Now do we want to add the words prior to enactment? That way we know about it before it's done. Would that alleviate your concerns, yep. Councillor Waitis? Yep. Any further questions or discussions? Was that the only area of concern that you wanted to have reviewed? As far as I know, I think that is the only thing that's uh, come yeah. up so far. Yep. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So then our recommendation. If you'd like, Mr. Reeve, you can add the words and direct a, a direct amendments to Article 4.3B. Well, we're in committee of the whole, so we can make motions here. But so they, they what just we got to do is general. You could bring, you could, um, that committee of the whole direct administration to provide the amendment, the amended bylaw at the next. Yep. So what's the wording changing to? It'll be on the screen momentarily. Okay. Sir, wait, is you okay with that motion? Yeah, what are the, what, what are the changes that, because we were discussing, what are, what are you going to write in there? Sorry. What is the recommended change? We're going to change uh, effected on to page 54. Are you on 254? Yeah, uh, on 4.3B, right? Yeah. So effected, it's going to become contemplated. And then at the end of the sentence, uh, after council, it's prior to enactment. Yeah, I'll make that motion because when it comes to the next meeting, we can yeah. still got time. Okay. Committee of the whole direct administration to bring forward the amended bylaw A24.20 to the next regular council meeting. 
questions or concerns? Debate on the motion. Seeing none, all those in favor? It's carried 5 0. Thank you. And now I need a motion to accept the Committee of the Whole Chief Administrative Bylaw Review Report as information. Roy? I move the Committee of the Whole accept the Chief Administrative Officer Bylaw 824.20 Review Report as information. Questions or concerns? Debate on the motion, seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Irina, did we vote on that first motion? Yeah, yeah okay, sorry. It's one thirty. <laughs> okay, we will move on to item 6.3 or 6.2 on the CFO's agenda and the benefit plan for elected officials. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so this uh, item is being brought forward to Committee of the Whole, uh, essentially to address a concern that was brought forward by a councillor regarding our benef current benefits plan and paid by the county with the termination clauses at age 65 and 75. So we've attached the uh, benefit booklet for council's uh, reference. Uh, so what uh, what we'd, we're bringing forward is that uh, the since there's one elected official over the age of 75 with rebu reduced benefits for life insurance, out of country medical and health spending, that would like to determine if council wishes to request any changes to the benefit plan uh, or increase or extend any of the coverages. Uh, there is, you know, we put in an option that Lamont County may increase compensation to councillors over 75 to offset that reduction in benefits. And since it's uh, with uh, these benefit plans, this is specific for uh, just council, we wanted to make sure that it was brought here so that uh, the discussion could be had. Comments from council? Councillor Wick. You're probably 35 years from age 75, so I'm good. <laughs> you're good. <laughs> Councillor White is you're probably about 20 years from age 75. <clears throat> Less than half. <laughs> anyway, uh, well, and there are two times that that coverage is reduced. Uh, most of the coverages are reduced at age 65 by 50 percent, and then uh, again at 70 or 75, depending on. Which, uh, which specific section. So I did list in the, uh, the briefing note, unfortunately my agenda is numbered differently, uh, but in the briefing note uh, on page one and two, it, it does show the, uh, the difference reduct, the different sections and what's reduced at what age. And so if, if council is happy with it the way it, it is, we can just leave it. If, there, if you'd like us to get some quotes for additional extension of coverages, we can do that as well. Uh, or if we want to just uh, look at what, uh, what we may want to change in compensation. Councillor Rewawa, Anaka, any? That's what I'm just looking at. Uh, Okay, so this extended help, it's the attachment, coverage cost of $348.96. That's prescriptions and massages and uh, acupuncture and things like that. That's correct. Yeah, they call that paramedical, so. Coverage is reduced for out of county, out of country benefits. Yes, so in, in that particular case, the only thing that is, you know, the, the if you're flying out of country, most of the, be the benefit plan for those under 75 would have medical coverage. Uh, however, those over 75, they, that is to, to, yeah, terminated. So. But even if you're over 75, you still have extended health coverage. That's correct. You still have extended health coverage for everything else that's already in the benefit plan that's in the attached uh, booklet. 
Councillor uh, Councillor Naka, any comments? Not really. One option that's very directly um, exercisable by council is just to maintain the health spending account. Um, 75 is a pretty arbitrary number. Um, whether that would be done within or outside the uh, the coverage, if if uh, council believes that a health spending account is something that a councillor should enjoy regardless of their age, that's an easy that's an easy fix. Yeah. So is that our service provider that covers the six hundred dollars, or do we? No, that is uh, that comes out of the the premiums we pay directly. That we pay. Okay. It's pretty much a dollars in, dollars out. That's yeah. correct. From uh, from my perspective, we all know what age we are when we run for council. I think that uh, if the clock is working against you and you get to an age where benefits terminate, then I think you should be prepared to accept that. I don't think we should impose uh, on the county uh, additional costs to cover the coverage that we lost, such as life insurance and stuff. I think the big one here is the fact that extended health coverage is still covered, irregardless of age. The only one that may leave a little bit for discussion down the road is the health spending account. And I guess that's something that uh, potentially council could look at putting in the remuneration policy if a council reaches 875 that he is allocated a $600 health spending account. I don't know, it's just kind of my suggestion, but I think that it's just like uh, before you run for election, if you're 74, you find out what the details are and at that point it should be pointed out to you that appreciate you're going to lose these certain health benefits won't be available or it could be at the orientation session also right so that's the only one that i would think is you know potentially the health spending account but from my perspective it happens fine if it doesn't happen council decides against it that's fine also to me the big one is the extended health and the dental which continue? Which continue? Yeah, I I agree with uh, Reeve to Duke's comments. So we just want to accept for information for now. Sure, sounds good. Okay, Councillor Rawawa, you want to make that motion? Do you want my hand? Oh, I can I can make it. Committee of the whole accept the benefits plan for elected official report as information. Questions or concerns? Debate? Seeing none, all those in favor? Right. Mr. Reeve, we understand the case to be that we will leave it the way it is. We're not taking any action. Okay, the only question I have is are we going to reviewing, be reviewing the remuneration policy for councillors? There is an adjustment that we need to make based on the application of the COLA. So we will bring it to a committee of the whole. And if there are any su suggestions or directions you'd like to give, that would be the opportunity. That would be the time to bring this up. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Good. All right. Thank you, Rodney. Item 6.4. PSAB asset retirement obligation. And I will turn this matter over to our CAO. And we're going to page 257, no, sorry, 330, 330. of our agenda. So Mr. Reeve, this is a, an information briefing. Uh, it's timed to coincide with uh, the audit where a new requirement has been imposed by the uh, Public Sector Accounting Board. Um, MGA requires us to file financial statements. Public Sector Accounting Board is the one that sets the standard. Um, so you've got two pages of report and you've got two pages of uh, briefing from the province of Alberta. After that, we've provided you a document which uh, we have marked as confidential, um, which um, was intended to provide you some information just to 
help understand the uh, the significance of of this uh, public sector accounting board standard change. So suggestion is to not discuss pages 334 to 420 in public, but rather to limit ourselves to the, the report and the two pager. If it is your desire, however, to address questions related to the, uh, to the attached report, that would require that council go into closed session under section 24 of freedom of information, protection of privacy. Go ahead, Rodney. Thank you, Mr. Tarnowski. So, um, as Mr. Tarnowski said, the uh, the Public Sector Accounting Board is responsible for updating regulations on a on a regular basis. That the province then normally will uh, will follow those. So, the uh, the letter from Metrics Group in regards to our 2022 audit planning had one of the items, uh, and it was under letter G. Uh, of some new obligations that the uh, the county must follow. So uh, it was a, a fairly small section on there and, and I thought it warranted a little more discussion with council. Uh, so what this is, uh, is that if the county owns any land uh, that has a, or any assets that re require a future obligation, uh, re regardless, keep going. Uh, regardless of whether or not we intend to dispose of that property, that we have to uh, identify those specific lands in our annual audited financial statements. So the requirement is for 2023 financial statements, but it must be reported on a 2022 basis. And the auditors are, are requesting early adoption of that uh, standard. So we... Uh, we agreed to that early adoption. So uh, what it's going to say is that is there if does the county own any land that there's a future obligation in? We do have uh, one particular piece of land uh, in regard to salt contamination. And uh, so what we must do at that point is determine what the cost is at this point record that on our financial statements. Uh, what it happens is it's it's essentially the cost of the asset gets increased by the cost of the future work and then a uh, obligation is recording uh, recorded as a liability on our financial statements. Doesn't cost us anything at this point, but the, uh, the justification for that is that when we sell that land, we're going to have to uh, incur that cost anyways. So those two basically just wipe each other's out in the future. Uh, so you are going to see a uh, uh, on the uh, the upcoming financial statements, you're going to see that. We're going to discuss it a little bit more. It's recorded in a ge very general uh, stance. It's stated that a piece of property owned by Lamont County has this obligation. Uh, the uh, Page 332 uh, gives a little bit more of the detail uh, of how we should be recording it, what we should be recording it. Uh, and, you know, that can give you a, a little bit more information on some of these calculations if you so desire. And then as well, um, the entire report that was done in 2019 on that particular land was included for, for council's review. Uh, these items are going to constant, or this, sorry, this amount is constantly going to be reviewed uh, on our financial statements, and it'll be updated every year as it goes forward. So, this is the uh, the the major item that that you're going to see as a new item on our financial statements. So, we wanted to be able to give council that uh, that initial uh, discussion point, and if we need to discuss detail, we can go into a closed session to do that. So, Rodney, we have some gravel pits that I'm not sure where they stand as far as the total reclamation process is concerned. But would they fall under this particular area? No, they wouldn't uh, because, we're one, they're still active and it's we've incorporated that cost already into our, our cost of doing business. So, uh, if we found something on those lands that 
had an impact that uh, was not readily disclosed, uh, then we would have to. So, but if you're looking at a, a gravel pit, the the we bought it for that particular purpose. It's going to cost us as we go. This is a this is a situation where there's other obligations after the fact that are not readily seen. Uh, you know, in particular, buying a piece of land, is there extra work that you're going to have to do when you buy it? Uh, or, you know, it, it's a, there's a similar one for landfills. So if you, have, if you have a landfill, there's a future obligation to test and to continually monitor um, where that wouldn't happen with a gravel pit. It becomes, you, you open it, do the work, close it, and you're done. Any questions, Councillor Anaka? So, does this apply to uh, properties in Hamlets that we have inherited? Do you do that for taxes? Say the house and well in Wastock? That's so. Yes, and yes, and no, depending on the situation. So, yes, it would apply in Hamlets, but it's more of something that has an obligation beyond. So more of say if we bought a brownfield property that had uh, future responsibilities for testing that's where you would want to put that on there uh, something like the the position the property in wastock it's readily apparent we have to uh, well we could sell it in the case the situation that it is in with just disclosing that uh, that requirement uh, these are ones that are more of there's a future obligation that you cannot sell it without doing those things. So in particular, the, the property that we addressed in the uh, in the package, uh, there is a environmental liability. So there's a requirement under another law to continue to do uh, the work on it where that particular property is. It, it's a, it's an open you know, site that uh, you can readily see, you can close it up and it's done. Okay. Mr. Reeve, there is a second part to that answer. Whenever we inherit a property through tax forfeiture, there is always a moment where, where the county generally guided by a council decision makes a decision whether they want to take title to the land or not. And what I've seen in other jurisdictions is when you've got something that's clearly very contaminated and would require significant remediation, you may decide not to take title of the lands. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, and I think it's extremely important if you're going to take property back for tax sales from a hamlet or whatever, I think we better ensure that there wasn't any gas station yeah. located nearby that particular piece of property. Yeah, exactly. And that that is that that's one of the big the big ones that this uh, obligation is now to designed to cover. So in summary, there's really no cost involved at this point. It's just a reporting technicality on the annual financial statement. According to the new rule changes, it's not required until 2023, but we can get ahead of the game and report it on our 2022 financial statements. Yes, that's correct. Okay. The, the benefit of early adoption is that we would have to restate our financial statements next year. So why, uh, why wait? Why waste the, the time restating the financial statements when we can do it now? So, and this is essentially a, an expansion of what we've already been doing with things like uh, like waste waste management and landfills. Okay. Any other questions or concerns? If not, I will look for a motion to accept the PSAB asset retirement obligation report as information. Councillor Rawarwa. The committee as a whole accept. The PSAB asset retirement obligation report as information. Any questions or concerns? Debate on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor? In favor. It's carried 5 0.
aquí. So we'll move on to item 6.5 of the Committee of the Whole, clarification on uses within the land use bylaw and municipal development plan. Peter, do you have an intro? We are basically on page 300 and 421. 421. 421. So Mr. Reeve, a question was asked how items like solar farm, wind farm, and data centers were being addressed in the land use bylaw. And uh, Ms. Cosby and, isn't it Crosby? Cosby. That is Cosby. Okay, I apologize. Ms. Cosby and Mr. Steffes are here to uh, answer that question. Good afternoon, Reeve, member of council. Uh, just a little background, uh, members of council, <coughs> excuse me, and administration attended the Brownlee LLP Law Seminar on February 16th, 2023. There was information shared highlighting the increase in development interests in solar farms, wind farms, data centers, and other non-traditional agricultural related activities, for example, bug farming and vertical grow operations, uh, etc. Some questions were raised regarding the status of these uses within the proposed land use bylaw moving forward. The proposed land use bylaw includes the following regarding the noted uses. Solar farms and wind farms noted as wind energy conver conversion systems, sorry. Uh, these uses are identified as discretionary uses within the agricultural, heartland heavy industrial, Heartland Light, Medium Industrial, and Highway Commercial, Heartland Agricultural Industrial, and Rural Agricultural Industrial Districts. The non-traditional agricultural related activities are identified as discretionary uses under the Rural Agricultural Industrial District only. These would fall within the definition of agricultural processing. Uh, as for data centers, they are not contemplated in this land use bylaw. That is, they are not a listed use in the proposed land use bylaw, bylaw, neither permitted nor discretionary. If a proponent wanted to pursue an application for a data center in Lamont County, they would have to pursue a site specific amendment to an area structure plan, as well as the land use bylaw for a direct control district, whereby council could approve or not any such an application and could specify any conditions or limitations. Should council choose, uh, it could make data centers a discretionary use throughout the land, uh, throughout Lamont County. It is recommended that this be addressed in a subsequent amendment to the land use bylaw. Introducing amendments regarding data centers at this time could be viewed as a substantive change and require a new public hearing. Planning is recommending third, second and third reading of land use bylaw and the municipal development plan later in the March 14, 2023 regular council meeting agenda, provided that there are no further changes required. Any questions for Tina or Colin, Colin regarding the <coughs> Land use clarifications. That that Dana Sanders, that's like the Bitcoin mine. Is that what? Correct. Okay. Given the uh, given the trend in terms of uh, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies these days, I don't know how significant the the risk of a data center is right now. Many many people are rethinking them. So Tina, just refresh my map memory here. Where's our rural agricultural industrial area right now? In the heartland. Be along Highway 15. Along Highway 15? Portions, small portion of Highway 15. Outside of the block? Mm -hmm. On the heart, adjoining the heartland, right? Adjacent to the heartland. Okay. <clears throat> So right now it's a discretionary use there. Which is that, sorry? The non-traditional agricultural. Correct. 
in that discretion or in that use only. Yeah. Yeah, I. The issue I have with is the bug farm. Bug farm. Bug farm. Bug bug farm. farm. They are not the cleanest, tidiest type of operations going. And do we want them on a major thoroughfare? So maybe we can potentially look at a redistrict of them? I don't know. I'm wondering if we want to walk through the um, direct control. The direct, well, not direct control, but the fact that it's discretionary and what that, the process. that, that could require. Yeah, mm -hmm. if you want to go through that process. Yeah, yeah if, if, for example, one of these do come forward under a discretionary basis, the uh, information, uh, once the information is deemed complete by the planning department, uh, referral notices are sent out to adjacent landowners. Uh, any agencies that may be involved, stakeholders involved, just to get some comment and feedback on what they feel, what they think, you know, um, yes, no, um, they don't want it there, this kind of stuff. Uh, once that circulation is complete, then it goes in front of a Municipal Planning Commission board for a final approval or, um, or refu refusal at that point. And during that process, staff would uh, recommend conditions under which it could proceed. Uh, reasonably, a bug farm does not have a significant uh, land use conflict with industrial. It does with uh, with an urban area or with a populated area. So those are the kind of factors that would come back from a referral. They, they have one big one in Ontario now, and I think they built it pretty close to an urban. They're having some trouble with it. So is that similar to a compost facility? Mm. I wouldn't think so, no. I don't think they, they I, honestly, I don't know uh, uh, much about bug farming. I mean, this is something new that was brought up at this Brownlee seminar that's, I'm doing more further research on it. Um, there, There is a few that do exist in Canada. Uh, the production of them more or less is to turn the product into a flower. Uh, which is being widely used already across Canada, the flower products. So uh, I, I don't know, I would say as it's being as utilized as a food, they would need regulations under some more acts based on being a food product. So it's, it's a learning curve right now. If, if you go to Safeway, they got three brands of crackers there that are made with cricket flour. So there are three it, brands it that people don't even know they're correct. eating them. Yeah. Did they taste any good? <laughs> no, but uh, we uh, did have true. a group and uh, they went in the kitchen and found them and they were eating them and they didn't know yeah. they were grossed out. Yeah. Like it's, uh, you got to read the ingredients. Yeah, it's out there already. Yeah, it's gross. So I, I think it's gross. But. So we can stop them from making an application. If we turn it down, then they can appeal it. To they the can appeal it. Yeah. And if they do require higher approvals, uh, it would be appealable to the to the province of Alberta, to the Land and Property Rights Tribunal. Okay, thanks. So, so by way of reminder, the genesis of this was a question, what is the status of these three or four areas within our land use bylaw? So we've identified how they are dealt with in, in three cases as a discretionary use. In one case, not contemplated in the land use bylaw, but can be addressed through a direct control redistricting. So, can we put bug farming in that category? Well, I think it is because it's a non traditional agriculture related well, activity. Not really. Because we're saying data centers are currently not contemplated. Correct. But I guess they could be contemplated, right? They're not contemplated in the bylaw. We don't say that a data center is either permitted or discretionary. It's just it's not, not permitted. Yeah. yeah. To be clear, the what we're outlining with in relation to the, the data center is simply the process that would be undertaken to introduce a new use within the land use bylaw, such as a data center. <laughs> well, and the comment in the report is that if council desires, data centers could become a discretionary use. I think uh, redistricting on a site-specific basis for a direct, direct control provides council more control. Okay. 
Any other questions? No. Okay, so one of my concerns is the potential location of this, because that's where I thought the residential or the sorry, the rural agricultural industrial district was. Can we kind of move that district? I'm not sure what you mean by move the district. Sorry. Well, allow them somewhere else, but not along Highway 15. Uh, they are discretionary in there. And it's pretty much the only place they're discretionary use, but in the end, in the, in the heartland area. Yeah, that would be good. Oh, thanks. Put it by the feedlot. Hmm? Put it by the feedlot. <laughs> okay, any other questions? One never gets it. You want a bug farm? No, that's fine. Division one doesn't get nothing. We'll give you a bug farm. <laughs> Let's go in division three. So, if there's no other questions, I will look for a motion that committee of the whole revert. Sorry, that committee of the whole accept the report as information. Councillor Waitis. Committee of the whole accept the clarification on uses within land use bylaw and municipal development plan report as information. Questions or concerns? Debate on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Yep. It's carried 5 0. Maybe a good time for a short recess. Okay, let's get out of the committee of the whole here. Uh, I need a motion that we revert back to the March 14th, 2023 regular council meeting. Councillor Naka. I move that committee of the whole revert back to the March 14th, 2023 regular council meeting at 1.54 p.m. Okay. Okay, I think we've arrived at the point where everybody's been waiting for. All in favor? Yeah. All in favor. All in favor. Yeah. Let's see, I'm just excited to get into that topic here. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to delay you because I'm going to call a recess here for 10 minutes. Yeah, I think it's just staff in there. Okay, so the land use bylaw. I guess after uh, we did our first reading on January 28th, Subsequent to that, there uh, was a story that came out of Thorhild and the structure of their land use bylaw, and that precipitated a lot of response from the community. And uh, obviously, it's also precipitated a lot of response in regards to what Lamont County's land use bylaw is here. In discussions with uh, a couple people earlier this morning on a recess, uh, there was two major concerns brought forward. Uh, one was the process that the public hearing was called in the fact that not enough notice was given. Uh, the time for the meeting being at nine o'clock in the morning versus uh, an evening meeting. Uh, the fact that the meeting was allowed to proceed with only uh, two rate payers present in person, one online, and then submissions from local towns and villages. However, council felt that we did the proper uh, notification process. If the group wants, I can have Ms. McCann go through that process in a minute here. But the public meeting was held. Uh, the concerns of the couple towns and villages were taken under advisement, as were the concerns of the people present here. Uh, we've dealt with those concerns and incorporated the changes into the land use bylaw that we have here. So from Council's perspective, uh, we feel that we followed the process that was required to get us to the point where we're at here now. 
Now, the other issue that was brought up to me this morning was that a ratepayer asked to be a delegation at today's meeting, and uh, she was declined that invitation. Now, in respect to declining that in invitation, according to the council procedural bylaw, if you need a statutory public hearing, you cannot present as a delegation to council because what would happen there is in council would be inundated requests from ratepayers to pre make presentations, individual presentations at at the uh, regular council meetings. So that's kind of the reason for that particular clause in there. Uh, the clause that's being referenced is maybe vague because it refers to the Municipal Government Act. However, it doesn't refer to the section of the Municipal Government Act that it refers to. So uh, I believe that portion of the uh, act was explained to the individual there. So hopefully that kind of alleviates that's concern. I guess the, the long and the short of it is, as your council, we want to get this thing right. We are not trying to hide anything. We are not trying to ram anything through that's going to impact you. I think council's main mandate here is to grow Lamont County, bring industrial development to Lamont County, and make it a place that people want to come and live. And whether that's in one of our urban areas, whether it's on our acreages, whether it's on a farm, wherever, that's the mandate of council. So the last thing we would want to do is put restrictions on people as to what they could do with their land if they do come to Lamont County. So I think the document that we have is, uh, is not much different than what we had before. The process was started in 2017. We hired Stantec Consulting out of Edmonton to uh, be our consultant in this matter. We had some public hearings before, or public consultations before COVID. COVID kind of put a damper on that. Uh, we didn't do anything for a couple of years, and then we had I believe it was one consultation, public consultation meeting on July 14th of last year, Tina, if I'm Correct. not mistaken. We had our open house that evening. And that was held in the town of Lamont here. I'm not too sure what the attendance was. There were some people in this room that attended at that meeting. And at that time, you also had the opportunity to bring your concerns forward. So that was the pre-consultation process and there was the public hearing process. So. From council's perspective, we feel that we, we followed the uh, procedure quite well. So, I would hope that you've taken the time to read the land use bylaw and the municipal de development plan. And if you've seen anything in there that you feel is going to be a detriment to you as a property owner or you as a resident of Lamont County. Because council wants to be open and transparent here, I think that council is prepared to provide you with the opportunity to write your letter or letters of concern to administration and they will be taken under advisement. Now, I got a big group in a room here, so I'm going to choose to not allow anyone to speak here today because if I allow one, then I should be allowing everybody in the room to speak. So we're going to do this in general terms. And I think that I'm aware of where your, where your concerns are from. But I think that, uh, like I say, council wants to be open and transparent. There's a couple ways we can do this. We can approve second and third reading as proposed here. And once you do second and third reading, that doesn't close the document. Bylaws and pros policies are open-ended documents. So you can always make amendments or changes if somebody brings back something that's really out of the ordinary or substantive, changes could still be made. So we could do that route and then make uh, changes down the road. 
or we could defer second and third reading and as I indicated, give you the opportunity to come forward with your questions and concerns to administration, at which point administration will review them. And if there is some really pressing urgent manners that we have missed as council here, then we would possibly, well, not if the changes that are needed are substantive, then we would consider calling another public hearing before we pass the second and third reading here. That's council's decision how, how they want to approach that. So having said that, uh, I think it's a fair, fair chance for members of the public if you feel that you missed your opportunity to give your feedback on the documents. I'm not concerned. I know that issues were raised regarding the procedure and stuff. We can't we can't undo the procedure that was used. We're of the firm opinion that we followed the proper procedure. We can't change the fact that an individual was denied access to be a delegation at a council meeting. But we can accept your responses as do you feel what's wrong or what changes you'd like to see to our land use bylaw. And like you say, it's an open document. So even after the land use bylaw is passed, if you feel there's a substantive change that would make a change to Lamont County, uh, we would be prepared to, to look at it and make the changes necessary. But for the most part, if you'll read the document through, and I have to admit, because I was asked two or three weeks ago by a ratepayer if I read the document, and that time I hadn't, but I have read the document through from front to back, so I am aware of what's in it, and uh, the last one I think we passed was 2007, which is a long time ago. So it's more than due time for this thing to be revised here. Council got any comments? <clears throat> oh, sorry, Dan. Sorry, I didn't. Yeah, you said very well. I'd like to make a motion to table, table the second and third reading and uh, let, uh, let the guys have the opportunity to let the ratepayers have the opportunity to bring forward their concerns. There was a third option, but my uh, the, the the motion I'm going to make is uh, Lamont County Council table second and third reading of Lamont Use Bylaw 848-22 and Municipal Development Plan Bylaw 849-22. <clears throat> That's going to be the motion, but uh, there's some discussion. Was there a third option that you had mentioned, Dave? With uh, what are the what are the what are the options for the ratepayers right now? If I do that, they got time to write letters to administration. What are their options? Their options would be if we want to give them a time limit of two or three weeks or whatever, they can write their letters to administration. Administration would review those letters, and if there is something substantive in those letters, administration would bring it back to council because we control the land use bylaw. It's our document. And at that point, based on the feedback we hear, would determine whether we want to make changes to the land use bylaw. Mr. Reed, maybe, and, I, maybe I can. Sorry, oh. let me clarify that. If the changes that are being requested are substantive, then I think that there would be a possibility that we would call a public hearing prior to passing second and third reading. An open house in a public hearing or just a? Just a public hearing. Because at the public hearing, Councillor White has to be able to air their concerns where they're given opportunity to speak at the public hearing. And if I heard the rate pairs properly today, I think that we would endeavor to hold that public hearing in the evening, not at nine o'clock in the morning. 
And could we just go and have a public hearing and let the people present their stuff? We got, uh, I got about, I got 30 some calls. We got, we had probably 40 people here today. Uh, we're not hiding nothing. Could we just go to uh, make a date for a uh, Mr. Eve, the uh, public hearing requires, generally speaking, that a bylaw have first reading so that it has legislative status. And a public hearing is people commenting on what's in a proposed bylaw. I think what the Reeve has proposed is that um, residents identify their concerns, have those summarized by staff and bring those forward. And that would guide direction in terms of how to amend the bylaw and then the bylaw once in a form could be taken to a public hearing for comment can we make it simpler and just have a public hearing again well the problem with calling a public hearing again is i'm not really aware of what any of the concerns are right now and i think that that's why if the rate payers come forward uh, with their concern and obviously uh, there is a communication system out there where people who aren't at the meeting today can be communicated with in regards to the process that council decided to undertake today and follow through from there. But as the need arises that another public hearing is warranted, I think your council will be open to calling another public hearing. Sorry, I can't take any comments from the floor. Then how are you supposed to know what our concerns were about if we're not allowed to speak? That's the problem. You can. You know what my concerns were about the bylaws if you listen and actually speak to people like they exist. Like we, we pay you to work. Okay, I said. I'm sorry, this is not an open forum. This is not a public hearing. I indicated that you have your opportunity to put your questions in writing. Obviously, you know where your concerns are. That won't happen, I can assure you that. They may go to the CAO, but you can address your letter to anybody, but nothing goes in the garbage here. I admitted it. I'm okay with that. Like I say, though, I'm not going to entertain any more comments here today. I made that clear when I started speaking. If you have concerns with the bylaw, putting it in writing is a lot easier than verbalizing it today. Thank you. I, uh, I'm here for the ratepayers and stuff, and I think we should have another public hearing, do whatever we got to do to open this up. I got nothing to hide, and it's, there's something we missed, which it's how many pages. So obviously, we missed stuff. I got no problem. Uh, I represent ratepayers, and uh, if I was the ratepayer sitting over there, that's what I'd want. So it's my recommendation we open it up again and do whatever we got to do to table it and then open it up with another public hearing at least. Councillor Naka, um, I would. I would be in favor of having people respond in writing. To, you know, if you want to address it to council or to administration and have us review it. Uh, I'm thinking having a public hearing with nobody providing a written document and signing it. You're kind of you're not getting getting any concrete information. So I think table it, put your concerns in writing and send it to us. And I think Debbie, if you would just repeat the advertising, what steps we went through for the first uh, public hearing, just to review what we did and what to be on the lookout for, for the next notification. Okay, 
So November 30th, December 7th, January 4th and 18th, 2023, regarding the public hearing, January 11th and 18th, promoted as next meeting council and public hearing for the land use bylaw and MDP was advertised in the Lamont Leader. Social media, Facebook and Twitter, Lamont County accounts, December 1st, January 4th, 19th and 24th. Um, July and then media release advisory, January 24th and February 14th. So there was plenty of advertising and notification that went out. The website, November 25th, 2022, it was put on there, notification of the open house and the land use bylaw and the municipal development plan. It was advertised in the Vagerville, on the Vagerville Country 106 community calendar January, for the January 24th meeting. Added to the Fort Saskatchewan online community calendar, East of Edmonton events calendar, CFCW community calendar. Um, yeah, that's the, all the places it was advertised that there would be a public hearing. And Mr. Reeve, I should reinforce that we follow the uh, requirements of the MGA in terms of how and when we advertise and what Ms. McCann has just outlined far exceeds the minimum requirement. What would be adequate timing? You said it's not enough. I'm, I'm how, how much time would you need? Two to three weeks, you said it's not enough. How much do we need? Two months. Two months? So if we did 60 days? Oh, yeah. <laughs> 60 days? So we could pick 90? Okay. Obviously, for when we went over this, uh, things have changed when uh, Thorhild, uh, they had a bigger mess and... Uh, now it's right, right across Alberta. Everybody's got this. All the all the municipalities right across Alberta. They're uh, they're getting questioned and whatever. And 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 it's good because there's stuff in here that I didn't realize was in there. Or it's uh, I can read it one way and you can read it another. Yeah. It uh, I learned that in ho when uh, the kids were in hockey, you don't send an email because they'll uh, they'll rip it apart and turn it on you. And uh, I can read it and you can read it. We're going to get a different different attitude or different thing on it. So in light of, yeah, we advertised, we did whatever, but uh, things changed since uh, January or whenever Thorhild uh, were getting tarred and feathered. So so now we got a, we got a problem that we got to fix. And uh, I'm here for the right bears. Let's fix it the right way. Yep. Okay, and I just want to make a comment here. I made a comment, I was being honest, that when we gave this thing first reading, no, I had not read the entire document. But my intent, because of time constraints, I was not able to read the entire document. But the document has been read. Second and third reading hasn't been done yet. So if I made that admission after second and third reading, then I think the press and you could hang me out to dry. But I don't think that you can use those comments against me because I passed first reading without reading the document. Okay, so where does council want to go with this? I'll make a motion to table it and then... Uh, so Mr. Reed, we had some suggested wording that might need to be adapted based on listening to your comments. I would opportunity in terms of number of weeks. So the way it's written there, if we get uh, lots of letters sent in or lots of different concerns, then that'll make us, then we'll have a public hearing. So Mr. Reeve, there's two ways this can proceed. You might receive uh, a list of uh, concerns that you may see as being substantive, in which case you would direct amendments and hold a public hearing. 
If you saw a list of concerns that uh, you did not believe were urgent or important, you could proceed with second and third reading of the bylaw as the way it is. So you have a, you have a fork in the road at the point where you see what the planning and development folks present back to you in terms of what was heard from the community and no, nothing will go in the garbage. Um, so again, a public hearing needs to happen based on something. A bylaw that has status. First reading is usually that status. But there is a fork in the road. You, if you look at it and say, well, there's more than what we can deal with here in, in a certain amount of time, approve the bylaw and do this as a subsequent amendment, or you look at it and say, well, this really isn't substantive, we're going to approve it, or yeah, these are really good and cogent uh, inputs from the community, we will be amending the bylaw and holding another public hearing. Those are your options. The only decision you need to make today is whether you're tabling it or not and how much time you wish to provide the public for commentary. Sometimes providing a little less time gets you more feedback. Sometimes you provide too much time, people forget, people put it off and don't, uh, and don't meet the deadline. So that's entirely your decision. I think we have a second, just so you see it, I think we have a second motion. The second motion would be the administration summarize feedback and bring forward for council consideration. Nope. So I think your council is being more than fair here. Obviously, you have concerns with the land use bylaw. We're giving you the opportunity to bring those concerns forward, and we will deal with it later. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll make that, but we'll add, make it 60 days, uh, put 60 days there. Mm -hmm. All this, the letters go in. No, 60 days. So we got some concerns that some might get thrown in the garbage. How can they, uh, who can they, can they CC a counselor with them or? Um, do anything they want. So if we make this motion, and they're writing to administration, they can give us a copy of what they send yep. in, right? Just to be. Okay. I'm going to make the motion, hoping 60 days is going to be enough and mm -hmm. get the pens ready and let's get at her. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, Lamont County Council table, second and third reading of the land use bylaw 848 22 and municipal development plan. 849-22 for 60 days, providing the public with an opportunity to forward any concerns to administration. Okay, the motion is on the table. Council, have any questions or concerns? Any debate on the motion? All those in favor? Yeah. It's carried 5-0. Moving on to item eight of the agenda. I guess we have to get Shane in here. Okay, proceeding on to item number eight. Emergency Services Department update. Peter, you got a lead in here. Mr. Reeve, only that this is uh, our continuation of a bi-monthly uh, update to Council on any uh, operational matters of significance. Regional Chief Milliken is here to uh, 
provide you some uh, some information and insights. I think he'll be supplementing it with some verbal information about the uh, fire training school. Thank you, Your Worship. Council, my pleasure to stay for an update of the Civil Services Department for January and February. Um, just touch on the high points. It's been a very busy couple of months. Uh, you know, moment, um, uh, just to discuss a previous thing to Council, attending the energy management team meeting in February May, and continue to attend emergency response team meetings uh, at least once a month. We finalized the purchase of the use recipe from the city of Saskatchewan and completed that approval. That's actually been left from our storage uh, station and we can begin the today. The Debbie disposed of five fire apparatus and one radio and the gut deals with the next series uh, after the price of sixteen thousand dollars to the very well in the city. Uh paid on four roster remains around eighty six people and uh team bats and nuclear daytime response capacity that we've been talking about. Um, it's pretty much the primary response issue. Uh, year to date, as of the end of February, the 61 responses have been under shoot time of just under nine minutes, and the average response time of 18 uh, minutes and 40 seconds. Shane, please take the microphone closer. Um, we've had a high number of structure fires uh, throughout the last few weeks, uh, particularly um, not really attributed to anything because it wasn't overly cold, but multiple station resources were involved in those um, doing really well uh, there actually, um, especially the evening ones, and we've had some really good uh, saves with some structure fires as well. Uh, brush pile program is coming to a scheduled end under county policy, so crews will begin doing thermal imaging inspections of the brush piles in early April, and so the last date for a, a brush pile to be totally extinguished is March 31st. Uh, in the fire training side, uh, we have had uh, two professional firefighter training programs that have been running since January. They're running concurrently and they're both filled to capacity. Um, both of these programs will conclude in April, um, sorry, one in April, one in May, and uh, both are using our internal uh, fire training facility. Um, and just as a note, uh, just by using our own internal training facility for these two programs, uh, we have a net savings of about $16,000 versus renting an outside training school, and that's just for that one program uh, that's been running. So really happy with that. We had a second officer command development program that just wrapped up, and we have two more sessions that are scheduled for the rest of the year, and that will complete the balance of that key professional development for our officers for command training. We also received a, a joint grant uh, through TransCanada Pipeline and another uh, organization out of Stone Plain to uh, hold a Resilient Minds for Firefighters Train the Trainer program. And uh, that's going to lead to some mental health support training uh, that's going to be launched in all stations throughout the balance of the year. Uh, so that's really important uh, for some long-term retention. And uh, I had mentioned some um, some of this before, but I'm, I'm pretty happy to say that we have our first external uh, customer for the Regional Training Centre that's booked time. Originally, uh, it was scheduled for March, but due to the late spring, they pushed it to uh, April. So they have eight full days booked um, with an anticipated net, uh, net rental income of about $12,000. So that's uh, essentially the first uh, four months of the year between the savings of not having to book an external site and the potential rental income, depending on what their final needs are, uh, lead to uh, us being in the green on the training center, about $27,000 for the first four months of the year. So really happy with that. Uh, and of course, our deputy chief has been pretty busy making sure that their needs are, are going to be met. Uh, in fire prevention and education, uh, we attended parents and taught session uh, and really enjoying the fact that we're out in the community more post-COVID. Uh, completed a number of occupancy and safety inspections, uh, resulted in one order that was issued and had a positive corrective action of a critical issue, one of our commercial occupancies. And uh, we had multiple investigations performed. Um, some we had to contract some assistance out uh, with uh, uh, in bringing in things like arson dogs. Uh, emergency management, we had an audit of our regional emergency plan on January 16th. It was a very positive review. There was no uh, nothing to really improve on. There was a couple of process uh, um, items identified by AEMA that uh, we could just um, change a little bit to be more industry standard. And as most of you probably got the endless Alberta emergency alerts on March 1st, uh, that was as because they uh, switched to the new alert ready system. Uh, we have four staff across our organization that are trained to issue emergency alerts. Let's 
kind of the high points, and uh, I'm certainly happy to answer any questions you may have. Any questions for Shane? Shane, what's the status of that uh, vehicle that we purchased from another fire department? Is it in service? Yeah, so, uh, so that is uh, that was the used rescue unit referenced uh, that is purchased. Um, it just finished getting its decals and all that last week. It has been was picked up today, so it's being uh, put in service over the next two days, and then the old unit will be removed from service at that time. The old unit's getting put put up for sale. That's the plan for yes. the motor yep. blows. Correct. Uh, what was the big holdup on that truck? Sorry. What is the holdup on that truck? The new one. What is the holdup? The day just got it today. Uh, so we didn't uh, take possession of the truck till early February, end of January with the holiday season. And then uh, our biggest holdup that we ended up uh, just foregoing was the availability of a mobile radio to install in the unit. Uh, there's still that chip shortage and stuff going on, so really tough to get that. Um, we finally made the decision last week that we were going to proceed without the mobile for the time being and just use portable radios just to get the truck into service. Any other questions for Shane? <clears throat> Shane, I appreciate you're in the last two weeks working for us. Your your last day at the end of March here. Correct. Yep. Specific date? Uh, March thirty first. Yeah. Friday. <laughs> March thirty first. <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to comment that council truly appreciates your uh, time with us as our regional fire chief. I think that uh, significant change and progress has been made in our uh, Lamont County Emergency Services and, and how we operate. I think that uh, historically all the departments operated as kind of their own entity and I think that there is a focus that you've probably started on to make that uh, focus more of a single unit focus instead of having the Lamont or Bruderheim or Andrew Fire Department that it's the Lamont County Emergency Services Fire Department and that it uh, it has to work together here. So from my perspective, uh, totally appreciate what you've done over the last three years. Three years. And uh, I'm not sure Peter gave a rendition how long you've been with the county, but I can't remember. That was a lot of... He was a mere baby when he started. <laughs> that was a lot of stats that he provided, but uh, thank you very much for your time. And we as council wish you well in your new endeavor. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So there's nothing else. We'll accept a motion to accept the emergency services update report is information. Okay, I move that Lamont County accept the emergency services department update report as information. Questions or concerns? Debate on the motion. Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. It's carried 5-0. Thank you, Shane. Number nine, committee reports. Councillor Anaka. Just a sec here, let me. Okay, the only report I have is from the Beaver Hills Initiative. A meeting um, highlights of that was uh, just some comments from some of the members there. Uh, 2,000 people participated in the Berkey this winter. I guess they're looking to do a bike event in summer. Uh, Elk Island did four buys and transfers this uh, past year. Four went to Indigenous groups, four went to others. Uh, they are monitoring wild boars at the park there. Uh, the park
Park is going to be a, do a fire burn at Elk Island March 27th, 23. And I guess uh, they will present uh, or will contact the county just in case we have any information to give us a heads up. Uh, as far as the BHI board, uh, currently we have 13 members and we could go to possibly get two more members. Uh, then the BHI held an open house on, on March 8th. That was a very good event in the evening, very good turnout in County Hall in Sherwood Park. There was a trade show from uh, groups that participate in uh, Beaver Hills, the Canadian Berkey, Elk Island Park, Alberta Parks, Enotech, Alberta, Nature, Nature Conservancy of Canada. Uh, there were two speakers that kind of gave a history of, uh, of the Beaver Hills area going back you know, about 100 years or so. They kind of gave a history of the in indigenous component in the area. And that's that's about it, unless you have any comments to add, Dave. Nope, you basically summarized it. Uh, was that event on March 1st or March 8th? March 8th. Okay, I did attend the event with Councillor Naka and a uh, couple pretty good uh, speakers at the event. Uh, they went back to the uh, days where the Indigenous people, I guess you could say, together with the buffalo ruled the land here. And uh, they put a lot of emphasis on the fact that part of their culture was to burn the grasses in order to basically get rid of diseases, bugs, uh, whatever would be in the soil and kind of rejuvenate the land so that you got that nice uh, fresh growth afterwards. So there is a lot of emphasis on, on that part. Uh, the other fellow talked about the uh, actual Beaver Hills Biosphere, I guess you call it park or whatever and uh, the original explorer that kind of went through and surveyed the park uh, by the name of Terrell. So I just found it interesting from, from the history of the place and quite honestly it's it's partially in Lamont County and it's, uh, it's a jewel for Lamont County and something we should be pretty proud of I think. So good history there. Yeah, that's about it. Uh, we have a foundation meeting on Friday. It's all day, but uh, nothing to report on that. That's all I have. Yeah. Yeah, I had a young library association meeting with us renewals were, were coming in very, very well. Uh, Edmonton is uh, very close to, to joining again. Uh, we're having a uh, well, resolutions have to be in by April the 5th. Uh, our annual meeting is either May 5th or <coughs> Excuse me. To be announced, to be confirmed. Uh, we are having a strategic planning session to be taken in November. Uh, and that was about for that one. I was at the uh, Million Member Water uh, Association. Uh, it was a very short meeting partnership with the uh, Dissolved Society Association uh, status. 
for the fact that it would cost $2,500 a year to, to have the status of the society when uh, 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 Saskatchewan Water Watershed Alliance. Alliance are members, so they are what you call it. So we, we fall under their right. and they have they are having governance model vision of being on April fifth and on April the sixth to be announced. And we have a John S. Matuka commission meeting last Thursday evening. <coughs> uh, yeah, we, this morning, Harold Old was there uh, from uh, pursuing our technical uh, work, but he has, he has retired. I think that class is going to be over with the, the, our new uh, manager is uh, L. Hardy. I think we'll be instated by April 15th. Is a couple of weeks. Yeah. Councilor Wick. Um, I only have one. I was at on March 3rd, went to the Alberta Industrial Heartland Association meeting. Um, lots of talk on hydrogen, uh, lots of talk on development in the in the area. Um, I'm pretty sure the Reeve will, will divulge more information on his report. Um, I have another um, meeting, committee meeting. It's the Go East Business and Community Tourism Conference on the 28th in Vegreville. So that's all I have. Thank you, Councillor Wick. Councilor I had a, had a pretty quiet last two weeks, but uh, the next coming on here is going to be very busy with committee is still in our care and stuff coming up. Okay. Before I get into my report, uh, this Housing Foundation meeting on Friday, is that a special meeting or is it just one of your regular meetings or? It's a regular board meeting plus uh, I think a one year plan and a five year plan, something like that. Okay. Okay. So I will bring up uh, concerns that the county has expressed over the last few months. Like which? Yeah. yeah. I, I'm not sure when, not that I've heard, heard okay. officially, so maybe he's just, Still you know, training, it again. Train, training, training her for a bit. Yeah. Okay. Okay, as Councillor Wick mentioned, we attended the Alberta Industrial Heartland Association meeting on, on March 3rd. Joining us at that meeting was uh, our CAO Peter and Economic Development Officer Tom. Uh, the first part of the meeting is in closed session, so I really can't reveal what transpired there. However, the second half, one was the AIHA calendar of events, and uh, there's a life in the heartland coming up, I believe on April 12th. I will confirm the date and send it out to uh, all of you. I believe that that life in the heartland is at the Shell, Cent Shell Center, which is part of the Dow yeah. in Fort Saskatchewan. And it's pretty good to attend those events, interact with the people. That event also allows for public engagement with uh, what's happening in the heartland there. 
Uh, we'll have another board meeting on June 3rd, uh, which Aaron and I will attend. On July 12th or 13th, uh, what AHA has instituted is they've instituted a uh, social night at the Calgary Stampede. And essentially what happens there is it's an open house event where both government representatives, industry representatives and the public appear and it allows for good interaction, exchange of information, so on and so forth. Uh, AIHA will pay my expense to go down there. If Councillor Wick wants to attend, he's either on his own <laughs> or he has to ask Vermont County to fund his bill down there. So it's up to Councillor Wick We're gonna. how he wants to proceed there. On <coughs> September 15th, which let me check that for sure. We do have our Alberta Industrial Heartland Convention. And that is on September 14th. So there'll be the reception on the 13th, the evening of. And that's happening at the Hotel McDonald this year. And then on the 14th at the Convention Center will be our uh, annual convention. And I think it should be noted that I am slated to become chair of the Alberta Industrial Heartland Association on September 1st at our quarterly meetings. So uh, as if my plate isn't full enough right now, it's going to get a little bit fuller. Uh, another thing that AIHA is looking at doing is, I'm not sure if council is aware of it, but one of our residents, former councillor, former Reeve, and former premier, was one of the founders of the Alberta Industrial Heartland Association. And uh, the Heartland Association is going to be celebrating 25 years next year which means we were formed in 1998. So we're planning a number of activities around the celebration. And at some point, we are looking at forward to recognizing the initial founders. One of the other founders, I'm not sure if anyone remembers, Mayor Vern Hartwell from Strathcona County, but him and uh, former Premier Stomach were two of the people that had the initiative to look at forming the Alberta Industrial Heartland Association. As Aaron mentioned, the executive director's report indicated a number of projects that we're working on. Uh, NCIA gave their updates. Pollution is becoming an issue. However, ironically, they measure the pollution from the plants, but they're not measuring the pollution from the city of Edmonton which is probably creating more pollution from their vehicles than what the plants are creating. So there's kind of a little misnomer there. And then we've identified, I believe, five uh, infrastructure priorities, the twinning of Highway 15, access to potable water, stormwater management, Vinca Bridge, and the last one escapes me, Aaron. I can't remember either. I know that there's an announcement now that Vinca Bridge is is a goal. goal. Yeah. We have a $60 million injection of money for it. Yeah. Oh, the other one was rail. Oh, yeah. Rail is a priority also. So, so yeah, interesting meeting, lots of stuff happening. It, it, we're always on the go there. And uh, one of the things we're looking at doing is we're looking at getting Minister Jean, who's in charge of uh, economic development to northeastern Alberta to come do a tour with us and as part of that tour I want to ensure that he comes to our industrial heartland to see some of the locations of the potential projects we're, we're working on and our water intake location. So that's about it for the Alberta industrial heartland. Mr. Reeve, the date you're looking for for life in the heartland was April 12th. We'll yeah. try to ensure that gets into your calendars. Okay. And maybe you can let the team downstairs remind them of that date. 
Uh, the other area that I attended on Tuesday, I love our president, Paul McLaughlin. He's a very open, transparent person. And if there's something on his mind, it essentially leaves his mind and uh, is expressed in, in words. The primary topic that we discussed last Tuesday in a virtual meeting was the uh, unpaid oil and gas back taxes. Uh, according to Mr. McLaughlin, enough is enough. It's time the government took some action on this file. I mentioned this morning uh, to the delegation that we're probably owed about $4 million of back taxes. Across Alberta, the amount of back taxes owing is roughly in the amount of 300 and some million, Rodney. I believe you're on that call also. Maybe if you can just quickly confirm that number. It's not, it's not small potatoes, guys. And they keep saying we're going to fix it, we're going to work on this thing, we're going to fix it, and nothing happens. Uh, the other area we talked about is the inability of us to impose taxes on development such as is happening in Division 3 where you got spur resources and perpetual petroleum drilling a bunch of oil rigs. <laughs> However, because the government has mandated that there's no well drilling tax, we're not receiving any tax revenue from those wells right now. And uh, that's another part that's going to be brought up and, and discussed uh, at length uh, and probably will be a hot topic at the uh, RMA convention coming up next week. Uh, I think that according to Mr. McLaughlin, uh, he wants to make this an election issue. So if you're in a situation where you can talk to a potential candidate or whatever, I guess we ask them what they're planning on doing with, with these couple issues here and stuff. So that, that was his main area of focus that day, was the unpaid oil and gas taxes. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we don't see some ads in a local paper because I think what's happened here is I don't think we've relayed the message to the public as much as we should. That this is part of our issue in regards to providing service levels and stuff. The other thing he touched on briefly was the uh, budget 2023. The uh, budget contains a lot of money. However, there was no indication we had asked at our last meeting with Minister Dreeshen that they consider doing an engineering study on Highway 15 to get that engineered ready. Nothing was mentioned in that regard. And really, other than providing money for irrigation in Southern Alberta, there's really nothing for the agricultural community. So somehow uh, MSI funding is down, really no increase in MSI funding, although the province has showed a pretty significant increase in their budget. Uh, the uh, LGFF, Local Government Fiscal Framework, they're still working on that. They still haven't come up with the uh, the right formula for it, apparently. So there's lots of stuff happening at the government level regarding funding for municipalities that just hasn't uh, hasn't occurred at this point. So interesting discussion. And as usual, I think we can look forward to a uh, lively discussion at our RMA conference coming up in a week's time here. So that's pretty much the extent of the two meetings that I was part of last week. And that's it. Before I ask for a motion, just let me check my calendar here once more. Uh, yeah, no, we're good. Okay. All right, so if there's nothing else, no questions? No. Need a motion, accept his information. Councilor Whitus. 
Uh, Lamont County Council accept the committee reports as information. Questions or concerns? Debate on the motion. Seeing none, all in favor? Yeah. Carried 5 0. Correspondence. Uh, Mr. Reeve, we have a number of correspondence items. Some of these have already been emailed to uh, members of council so that uh, you didn't need to wait till the issuance of the agenda. First item is uh, an initial analysis of the Alberta budget 2023 that was provided on March 1st. Government anticipating a surplus of 2.4 million. Local government fiscal framework remains at 722 million. MSI operating funding doubled. We've got another item a little later. Overall in the province from 30 million to 60 million. Strategic transportation infrastructure program has increased from 35 to 43. So we remain hopeful on our five bridges. Uh, Water for life a little later on. Policing assistance to municipalities has stayed consistent. Read through the balance uh, on your own. Uh, the second item, a letter from Travis Taves. Um, references how he's heard from Alberta municipalities the need to have secure, reliable long term funding and uh, speaks to the estimated 2023 MSI allocations. Um, those are also in a subsequent uh, attachment. We have a save the date here for a golf tournament in the uh, town of Gibbons, something that councillors may choose to consider and. Um, not certain whether this is a matter for a council decision or something that councillors should consider independently. The Alberta School Foundation Fund uh, provided uh, information on our account. We received the most recent invoice for almost a million dollars on March 1st. On page 655, it shows our quarterly payments, which add up to about 3.6 million. On page 656, we've got a summary of our res and non-res amounts and shows how residential and farmland and non-residential um, assessment contributes towards payment of the, uh, of the requisition. On page 657 is uh, an email indicating that um, Minister Schultz is unavailable to meet with us during the RMA convention. However, indicates that we might call the minister's office to uh, request an opportunity at a later date. Similarly, on page 658, Minister Dreeshen indicates he's unable to meet with us due to overwhelming number of meeting requests during RMA. On page 659 is a summary of our capital and operating MSI. Capital has stayed the same at 909,000. And as was re referenced in the earlier letter, uh, the operating MSI contribution has doubled from 159 to 319. I do believe, and Mr. Uh, Boyko can confirm, I do believe that's taking it back to where it was. Yeah. And then, uh, I believe this last, yeah, this last page was uh, the letter that conveyed the information on the uh, on the MSI dollars. So that's all we've got. <clears throat> the school board, uh, they got three point, a little over three point six million dollars from our rate payers. Alberta School Foundation page. Yes. Page uh, 655, the total of four payments added up to 3,635,690 bucks. Another million for uh, housing and then uh, three qu or a quarter of a million for landfill and then the police requisition. So, so Mr. we're paying five million bucks. So Mr. Reeve, while this 3.6 does come from the single taxpayer, this is not part of the of the tax revenues that we collect for property taxes. This is what we collect for. For school tax. No, I know, but I mean, so does the requisition yeah, for I'm the housing. Saying. I'm just saying everything adds up to six million bucks before we take ours. 
Correct. I wonder why they want to kill us. <laughs> well, I mean, quite honestly, you guys, that, that housing foundation requisition is more than what the total requisition was last year, our payment this year. So yeah. you guys got a tough job to do down there to try and get that thing under control there. Well, use it or lose it because they're, they're not using the old age homes. What are you going to do? Uh, it's it's sad. One day we might need it, but it's not going to be there because you, you can only run half full for so long. You and I might have to have an offline conversation. Uh, water for life. We utilized water for life to run the water line to St. Michael, right? Yes, water for life is a potable was, water was 10, 90 Split, I think. They paid 90, we paid 10. Could you check Rodney, like, in order for us to distribute water from the end of the pipeline to the residents of St. Michael now, like we're utilizing the old infrastructure. Is there any way that this water for life money could be used to build out the infrastructure for the residents in St. Michael in order to allow them to get cisterns and new water lines so they aren't using old corroded pipes? transmission. Yeah. We have a reservoir there? No. No. Uh, 3,000 gallons of plastic. 3,000 gallons of the reservoir. Okay. Uh, I don't think, uh, I don't think it's, it's a transmission. Yeah. Well, they're going to put a truck fill in there for us, or was somebody not going to pay no, for a truck fill? We're going to do that ourselves. That's we're going to do that ourselves. That it. Doesn't hurt to check. Oh, you could check it then, too, but uh, uh, St. Michael is. Uh, you need a complete water system. Yeah. Complete, complete lines. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Just prior to prior to this, prior to this water for light coming through, the water line coming through, uh, we were uh, we, went, we did a uh, uh, cost uh, costing of uh, what it would cost for a sister. So my suggestion at that time was to do $5,000 grant to each uh, household. Uh, the, the CEO at the time, he went and he did a little better. He had a, found a, a company that would put it in for $15,000, the household, the system, and put a pump. Water in there, you have you, you have water, right? The majority of them didn't pay the water water bills anyway. Before. I don't know what it's like now, but I know what it was then, right? So uh, you don't put no water, you don't get any. Well, I know that our CFO is looking over there, saying, "How in the hell are we ever going to recover the cost of exactly so. this thing, right?" We never will. But no different than the heartland you bring good water to a place eg saint michael that's a that's a hamlet that has an opportunity to expand down the road and it's not going to expand if you don't get a good water service was i playing with that you, if it's not going to expand if you don't get a good water system which is my request why we just investigate and let's see what we well can i do guess there. i guess you could and you, everybody would pay their own own share. I I, I can't see uh, I can't see the county paying uh, for for these water lines. They're going to be paid on frontage or whatever. Some yeah. some way. But we could even get a seventy five twenty five or whatever. Oh, if you be. can get a grant for that, uh, yeah, one hundred percent. I agree. So, anyway, yeah. take a look into it. Any I other think questions? Water for life is still there. I think. Yeah, they brought it back. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And they've increased the funding considerably under that Almost too, right? Double. Just about double what it was before. Okay. Uh, any other questions regarding correspondence? If not, I need a motion to accept correspondence as information. 
Councillor Wick. <coughs> to make a motion that Lamont County Council accepts all correspondence as information. Questions or concerns? Debate? Seeing none, all those in favor? It's carried 5 0. Okay, gentlemen, we're going to be going into a closed session. <laughs> <laughs> So your only advantage of hanging around is uh, we'll call you back for adjournment. Thank you for your attendance today. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Yeah. See you. Do we need a? What did your wife do to you? You walk in with Huh? It's like six. Do we want a six minute recess? Yeah. yeah. Okay. We'll reconvene the March 14th, 2023 Council meeting at 324 p.m. And we will proceed to item number 11, closed session. We have two items here. One is the non residential tax strategy, and the other one is an in camera labor. So we'll start with 11.1 the non-residential tax strategy. Thank you, Mr. Reed. Okay, that's my fault. Need a motion. <clears throat> Councillor Wick. Make a motion that Lamont County Council move into closed session at 325 p.m. pursuant to Division 2, Section 1617, 23, 25, 26, 27, 29, the Freedom of Information Protection of Government. Too bad you didn't read the policy so fast. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions or concerns? Debate? All in favor? Aye. Aye. It's carried 5 0. So, coming out of camera, uh, first off, we'll deal with the motion on the board that we extend the meeting past 4 p.m. I can do that. Come on, County Council, extend the March 14th, 2023 regular council meeting past 4 p.m. Questions or concerns? Seeing none, all in favor? Yeah. It's carried 5 0. Uh, the second item I'd like to deal with is to remove 11.2 from in camera. So, does Councillor Whitus have to make the motion to re remove it? Yeah, yeah. We remove from the agenda. Okay. All those in favor? Yeah. Are you caught up? Yes. Okay, then I need a third motion here to endorse the non-residential tax strategy and concept. Aaron? Make a motion on the Lamont County Council to endorse the non-residential tax strategy and concept. Questions or concerns? Debate on the motion? Seeing none, those in favor? Okay. Carried 5-0. And we will adjourn the meeting at 418. <laughs>